Hello everyone, welcome to this side of the internet. My name is Brandon and today we're going to be talking about color and light. Color and light is probably the most enjoyable part of the painting process, at least I think. Determining that light source, you know, the angle of the light source, the color of the light source, the, the colors that of the local color that you choose, have a, the same scene but different colors of that scene can make it appear uh, dramatically different. We're going to be talking about a lot of things, uh, bounce light, atmospheric perspective, some shadows. We're going to be having uh, a couple of demos in there, a few live paintings, a lot of fun. So welcome to the color and light class and let's get started. So a little bit about me, I am a self-taught artist. I am primarily working in digital, mostly Photoshop using a Wacom tablet. That is going to be the tools we're going to be using today in some of the demos, in some of the demonstrations. So I consider myself, I don't know, an amateur, but not t too much of an amateur. I have been doing this for a little bit, but just as a disclaimer, I have not been professionally taught on this. This is going to be, you know, that that class where I. Uh, try to communicate some of my thought processes and I hope to be able to uh, share some of the knowledge with you all. I mean mostly of what I have learned is either from reading books or uh, watching uh, countless hours of YouTube videos. Now not to toot my own horn but I am uh, fairly happy with uh, some of the pieces that ha I have been releasing here lately and I think that's a, a good thing for an artist to have. Should always be proud of proud of your work even if you're not like happy with the outcome be proud of yourself for you know doing art still even if if you fail just know that that's just a part of the process one other thing that i wanted to mention about myself is something recently that i did was i participated in the challenge of the month for draw with jazza this challenge was to to take one of his line drawings and color it in and i was like oh wow this is this is right up my alley i i gotta do this i entered in the the, the project and guess what i didn't win i did not win but you know the, here's the piece i didn't win but I was featured in his video as one of the finalists. I love the way Kitten Bomb's one piece has a mix of reds and purples throughout, the red feeling a little more earthy. So that kind of helps out with a little bit of, I, of me pressing forward on here. It, it kind of validates, yeah, hey, maybe you do know what you're doing a little bit. Okay guys, let's go over some of the basics and that is uh, this little lighting setup here on this sphere. Let's start on the left and identify some of the, the terminology here in this lighting situation. The light's coming from the left, therefore here on the left side we have the light side and on the right side we have our dark side. Now on wood material, you can't really see the highlight. So I have this marble here. You can see that little white speck that's the highlight and that is the point on the sphere where those planes are perpendicular with the light source so that is the the brightest of brights as far as this object goes um, right here it's it's very soft and it's almost unidentifiable um, but that's where it would this is right here on on the wood sphere that's where the highlight would be and then you got your overall uh, light area and uh, it's it's slowly gradating over into the the darks you get into your mid-tones or right around here and then this line right here is called the terminator that is basically the the point of the sphere that is transitioning over into shadow that's where the light rays are being casted and they're like they're like, thing, 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 thing. and then th right here is the edge of the of the, the the sphere where those light rays cannot touch. So that's that's what's causing that edge there. And it's it's a soft edge because it's a sphere. You know, it's not like a cube where it's like light and then dark. After the Terminator, there's your core shadow, which is the um, a, a dark part of the uh, the dark side. Yeah, that's, that's all I got about to say about that, uh, because the really interesting part and the uh, the kind of the uh, epiphany, I guess. I don't know if it's called epiphany, but it was a big milestone in my artistic 
career learning about bounce light. It's the light side of this little edge here. And with that, it, that's bounce light or AKA reflective light. That's just saying like where this plane here at the bottom is lit, that's bouncing light back up into the shadow side. Now bounce light is one of my favorite things because it, it you can have, uh, I don't know, it's really influenced a lot of creative decisions uh, in, in some of my pieces. I mean, you can really have some fun with that because it's not only carrying the light, but it carries color as well. And we'll get more into bounce light later on. Next is your occlusion shadow, and that is the, the point of contact where the object meets the plane. And that's usually the darkest because, you know, not much light is getting uh, down in that crease. And then uh, followed by that is your cast shadow. That can get pretty dark. Usually outside it can uh, appear dark and, and blue really because the sky itself. Okay, so when you're outside and you have the sun lighting up and then um, what's, what's happening on the shadow side, it's still being lit. It's not like total darkness, but it's just being lit from a weaker source. It's being lit from the blue sky. Moving onward, uh, right now the current lighting situation is similar to a late afternoon, almost, I, I guess, sunset, where you get these, uh, the, the, the sun's at a lower angle, so the, the shadows are being really sh dramatically stretched across. There's other lighting situations out there in, in the world, and that could be like a cloudy day. And, okay, I know, it's cheap, it's dirty, and I got my models, they're passing out, they're tired of standing here, but this lighting situation, and man, it's rough, but you gotta have a little bit, oh my gosh, you gotta have a little bit of imagination here, um, but this is more like a cloudy day. You have this more diffuse lighting situation where our, our core shadow and our terminator the, the, it's very soft you it's hard to identify a light side and a dark side now our occlusion shadows uh are still fairly obvious but um that's a that's kind of how lighting works on a cloudy day and since we've talked about sunset uh time of day and cloudy days but uh we can talk about what, what is that maybe five o'clock and then there's like high noon this is probably why my lighting situations in my art are, is is good because I don't I don't do high noon shadows because there's no drama there with those shadows pointing straight down like that, that, that where's the interest in that key to good lighting is drawing a scene with good easy lighting also I guess this is a good uh, point to mention out that there's a very clear d definition of what's light and what's dark so in your art, you you want to be clear with with your lights and your darks. A phrase that has been mentioned to me that I want to pass on to you guys because I, I think it's it's affecting my art and it kind of makes me think a little bit more when I'm applying light. Your darkest lights should never be as dark as your brightest darks. Okay. Your darkest lights should never be as dark as your brightest darks okay so so yeah just keep uh, your va value separate make sure you you define your your lights from darks unless it is a cloudy day or or everything's in shadow or something like that well i think that's it hopefully that was educational on on to bounce light all right, let's get into bounce light now. Okay, so I've set up my model here with a fairly extreme condition, but that is not to say that you won't find scenarios like this in nature because it, you will. If you take a look at the shadow side here, you can see a lot of this, the same hue that is on the surface, and that is because, uh, as illustrated previously, the light is hitting the surface and reflecting like a mirror would back up into that area you can see how this could be a huge driving force for creativity in your art to manipulate those bounce lights and just uh, have fun with color in in your objects even like here in his bill you can see that there's variations of the yellow and the green and you can just get really really have a really good time playing
playing with those. Now this bounce light in uh, most situations, I won't say all because um, I feel like there's a, a situation for everything, but in most situations your bounce light is still a shadow. It's not going to out way the light side so just pay attention to your values when you're adding in that bounce light and try to keep them on the lower end and keep them around brighter than your core shadow but still uh, darker than the darkest part of your lights now I'm gonna put a little piece of color beside Donald's head and see if you can guess it without me even showing you Can you guess what color that is? Well, I think you can because it's it's pretty noticeable. It's it's orange, obviously. Um, but that look at that! Isn't that amazing? How how light is working is reflecting off this plane and just really just pouring into those shadows and mingling with those greens and and some of the the grayer tones of the of the shadow and they're all just is creating a very an interesting um, kind of rim lighting there and you would think that it's its own light source itself you won't really find the bounce light in the lights I mean I'm, I'm starting to block the light itself but if I could angle this just so that it's being lit and on the light side it, you can't, I can't really get that that orange in there like I can here on the um, shadow side and that is because the one it's not being lit properly but the light source itself is just so intense that you're not gonna really see any of that bounce light because it's just being outweighed by the, the intensity of the, the primary light source okay so we're gonna talk about local color next but before we start on that I want to just talk about uh, my little lighting setup here. It's pretty interesting instead of having the spotlight like right here in my eyes too bright Okay, <laughs> too bright. I set up, you know, I'll just show you what I did So I got the the, the spotlight there and then I have it facing a, a white panel and that is just causing a significant amount of indirect light uh, coming over here and lighting my face um, and remember how I said earlier that you, uh, what did I say? In most situations, your bounce light is still a shadow. It's not going to outweigh the light side. But here, this is literally bounce light, uh, and it's treating as a highlight here on my face. And then, you know, it's, a, it's pretty late now, and it's dark and gloomy. It's raining. And there's a lot of blue light coming on this side. It's, it's really, really interesting kind of color scheme. You can even see like the uh, the bounce light from my hand. Like this bounce light from from the panel to my hand is bouncing onto my neck, and you can see how it, it just gets a little bit lighter there in that blue. And the orange from my hands is playing in with those blues on the from the uh, the light from the window. Uh, even though that's a shadow side, there's still some kind of light coming in. Um, so it was uh, interesting. A little setup before I got started here. Now, local color. Okay. Okay, so I thought I was going to blow your minds with this section on local color, but apparently uh, it, it's not going to work out the way I thought. I thought the, the yellow lighting from the spotlight was going to affect my model here a little bit more dramatically than it has, but regardless we can learn something from it. Okay, so local color is the actual physical color. Uh, you know, if, if you pull out your Crayola and it says red on there, it's, it's red. The actual color that we kind of perceive it as. I was thinking that local color was kind of a myth because in nature you, uh, the sun really does affect how the color actually is but we perceive it as like the grass is green the trees are brown but if you consider the the actual lighting from the sun and then the uh, secondary lighting from the sky your colors uh, are really determined on that with this setup here um, the lighting really isn't affecting the local color if I, I drop 
his hat here um, it is blue I mean straight up like that's like <laughs> blue right there you can't even get more blue than that uh, same thing with his with his bill uh, it's I mean how do you <laughs> even get more yellow than that it does have some uh, variations that's a that's a good note to to make here is the the variety of different yellows and uh, the slight shift in values in 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 his bill you know it's it this plane is facing sl just a slightly a little bit more tilted away from the the light source so it's gonna get darker not so dark that it's casted in the shadow but a little uh, variation there and then obviously here's his highlight of that plane and it's getting less uh, less uh, saturated to to appear brighter that's what local color is that's a pretty easy concept to to grasp now there's this one artist known as simon i can't pronounce his last name it's right there um there's the website um uh, he's got a he's he's my hero really i mean this this is some really <laughs> incredible artwork that he does I, I've, I've learned a lot about just studying um, his his work and doing some little thumbnail studies on the color I would oh man I would love to if he would make a class on here that would be fantastic anyways so I have one of my favorite uh, paintings here by him and to illustrate my point about local color is I in this painting there is no local color Maybe that car is green, maybe his sweater is red, and maybe that building is yellow, but this is a very monochromatic piece, uh, meaning uh, it's just blue. Granted, the, the windows are actual yellows, like if we I drop the, the warm in here, you're gonna get some orange and yellow. But look at this uh, this brick right here, these bricks they appear f pretty much yellow don't they i mean they kind of look yellow you would say that was that local color is yellow but let's eye drop look at that i cannot find <laughs> any yellow in there that is all blue that is all blue right there like local color for this piece for at least this time of day is is non-existent your perception of color is manipulated by the colors and ambient lights around that color this appears yellow to us because if we i drop this watch the shift over here it goes more saturated and further up to the blue the color around it is a lot more saturated a lot bluer than this color and therefore that's why it appears yellower grays the tint can can really be tricky like that you can illustrate the the idea of that color uh, by using a, a grayer tone so i guess the bit the big takeaway from uh this is that consider your ambient light uh and consider the environment around uh the uh, the painting and if, you know if it's sunset you're gonna you're gonna get what is known as the golden hour uh, where everything is orange and uh, reds and you can play a lot with that the afternoon you're gonna get more yellows from the sun and you're gonna get some really deep blue shadows yeah so consider that ambient light that bounce light and you guys should be good should be i don't know Okay, let's talk about atmospheric perspective. Atmospheric perspective is a great way to add depth into your art. It also makes your art look more realistic. So what is it? It's basically the forms and objects that are further away, have less details, less contrast, less saturation, and are overall brighter than the objects in the foreground. The further objects also tend to take on the same hue as the sky. Now in the demo here, I'm painting two examples of this. Now they're fairly quick sketches so don't judge me too harshly on here, but they clearly illustrate atmospheric perspective. Let's talk about the top one a little. You can see the subtle mountains in the background. Now if we were standing on these mountains we would see some greens, browns, basically earth colors. But since we are viewing the mountains from a distance, they pretty much are blue silhouettes. They are blue because they take on the similar hue as the sky. 
Now, if this was a sunset, I would make it a little bit more orange, or if it was storming, I would make it a little bit grayer. Generally, the sky will be brighter than the mountains, so the silhouette of the mountains are clear. I think with this piece, I did a little too intense on that sky gradient and made the values a little too dark. If I wanted to take this sketch and render it into a more finalized state, that's something I would gather more references for and, uh, and do a little bit better job at working that out. Along with some composition changes, I think the floating islands are a little too equally spaced. But speaking of the islands, I'm using repetition in this piece to sell that those are floating land masses. In the foreground, I make it very clear for the viewer what it is they are looking at. So when I add a silhouette of the island in the background, the viewer knows exactly what that is. Now for the mountains, I didn't need to add mountains in the foreground because we're all uh, very accustomed to seeing mountains. We, we know what they look like. But since we're not used to seeing floating islands, uh, it's important that I illustrate for the viewer exactly what it is that they're looking at. If I just had silhouettes of floating islands and nothing in the foreground to clarify what that was, nobody would know what it was. So if you're designing like your own fantasy scenes and you're do designing something unique, repetition is a, uh, a good use to uh, clearly illustrate for the viewer what that is. Okay, so let's move on to the next example. This one, much simpler. This time I'm going for a more monochromatic color palette. Since it's in the woods and perhaps early morning, I quickly designed this forest scene by simply using lighter values in the background and darker ones in the foreground. Now I'll try to choose the right hue or value when drawing one of these tree barks, or even in the last example, I'll try to choose the right blue for the mountains. But if I'm having a hard time selling that depth, I will simply eye drop the sky color, take a soft brush and lightly airbrush over the object. This works out great if perhaps I render too many details for those objects in the distance. It helps remove the contrast, applies the correct hue, and helps flatten it out the way distant objects should be. Yes, I did cheat for the characters in this piece, but that's okay with me. I still develop the composition, which is more important than how well the characters are designed, at least uh, for me. Also, this is just an atmospheric perspective lesson, not, uh, you know, character design. So I'm okay with taking some shortcuts on, on that. As we come to the end here, I just want to say this effect also can work indoors and it can even be applied to character design. Say you're designing a dragon, well, you can render out his face really well, and to emphasize the scale of the creature, add some atmospheric perspective to his body to illustrate some depth. Okay, that's all I got to say about atmospheric perspective, and to conclude this section, I'm just going to leave a few examples of paintings here, just to drive home the idea of atmospheric perspective. I found this interesting picture while looking for a house to buy, and um, I, I, I thought it was pretty interesting little little image because it, it says a lot about how how light works um, as far as you know the outside lighting goes with the sun and the sky and everything. Um, so we have our primary light on the left, which is the sun. And you can see it shining through, um, you know, a window over there on the left. And then we got our secondary light source, which is the sky. The sky being a, a light source in itself. Now, if it's a cloudy day, uh, we'd probably be seeing a, a little bit different uh, situation here. You, it'd probably be very, very muted. First of all, you wouldn't have the sun. And that blue light may be a little bit, it wouldn't be as blue, I think. I think everything would be kind of diffused. 
And another interesting thing before I end the uh, the clip here, I want to point out is if I eye drop this this side of the wall, I just want you to pay attention to this in color dialog box area, and and watch the shift in in um, in its location. Watch where it goes. So right here, here, now we're gonna go here towards the corner. And then we're gonna go here towards the wall. The uh the the bluer wall. And it is bluer. Um, it, it it actually has like no blue in it though. It's just a grayer, uh, a more grayed down version of this hue. The hue, if you were if we're looking at this slider right here, the hue itself, it's hardly even shifting at all. I mean, it's subtle, so um, it, it is doing a little bit. But for the most part, it's staying in those warms. But it appears cooler because it's more grayed down. And something interesting to take home with you guys is um, you don't always have to use the uh, cooler colors to show a cooler temperature, right? And and the reason, obviously, why uh, it's getting uh, it's warmer on the left and cooler on the, the right is because of the bounce light. You know that light shining in on that floor, illuminating it, and then that light temperature the 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 temperature of that light is bouncing up into the walls carrying its value as well as its color uh, up into those those walls and and as an artist i think this is really fun to play with because you can play with the intensity of of how much it travels if you're going for realism you want to be kind of subtle about it but if you're going for more uh, personally an impressionistic type style that i like to do is you can uh, tug and pull and maybe put uh you know a little bit more bounce light up in those those areas than than you would see in real life to kind of add a dramatic effect of, of color and light. Even take a look at the ceiling. See this little warm here and the cools here? Um, that bounce light's hitting the, the ground and reaching up into the ceiling. I did this effect um, on this one picture. You know, the sun's coming in from this angle, therefore it's casting this, this light source through the window and but it's also hitting the the grass on the outside and I was like well if it's hitting that grass so intensely on the outside uh, maybe some of that bounce light would be like coming up into the, the the window and like hitting the ceiling just a little bit and I didn't know for sure if that's really how it would work but I was like you know what I'm, I'm the artist I can make that decision I think I heard this quote the other day and I thought it was really cool and I, and I think it can relate to this. It's uh, not trying, we're not trying to uh, make it appear realistic. We're trying to make it appear believable. I think it was something like that, but that sounds legit, right? And that's what I do with my art. I, I don't, I want people to look at it and believe what they're seeing. I don't want them to, to nothing to come out and question, like, why is there, why is that there? So being subtle with it, I don't think anybody's uh, asking questions. Now, if I, if I directly pick that color and put it up in there people might be like oh what what's going on there so yeah have fun with bounce light i keep talking about bounce light because it's it's so such an interesting uh thing okay well that's uh that's it for this one uh let's talk about something else or go draw something why is my face so blurry why does it want to look at this i'm just gonna have to turn this off for the next one Whatever. <laughs> All right. Why is it so freaking dark? Is it this? Why are you picking that up? Thank you. <laughs> oh my gosh, this camera. All right. So.
So I did this painting demo pretty quickly, and I want to use it to show you uh, this uh, some special effects, first of all, um, that you can use in Photoshop that can really intense your lighting. And the idea of a, um, a bloom effect, and uh, what I mean by that, you have a really intense light, such as the sun or a sunset, and uh, a foreground object, and but the, the, the light's so intense that it kind of overlaps the object itself and you'll see this not only in uh, pictures but you'll see it in real life as well so I recommend using this effect it can add some drama to, to your piece um, so let's get started with that I could use a normal brush and pick my color here and change it I guess we'll do since the Sun is yellow primarily in this area um, we'll use a bright yellow and I can use a normal brush or a, a, the layer set to normal and do this and I'm, I got about 50% opacity and that's kind of cool but instead of doing that I like to experiment with the linear dodge blend mode this creates uh, some compelling lighting effects and I'll show you that right now so instead of that let's uh, create a new layer let's change its blend mode to linear dodge and we're gonna take it down a little bit. I find that um, having it in the dark, mid to dark range uh, has a better effect. And here I'm just airbrushing it. So there's that, and then there's the normal. You see how the the normal is a little bit more opaque and not blending with all the shapes that I have there quite as well as the linear dodge blend mode. And you can also do this effect with a, a color dodge and that might yield different results but instead of having it dark I'll I'll usually have color dodge uh, for a brighter effect. And I encourage you to um, you can see there and that's kind of neat too because that's uh, putting some reds in that foreground shape which I, I find quite interesting. So I encourage you to experiment with the, uh, those two blending modes when you're wanting some really intense lighting. So now we got the sun and maybe I want to see, I'm going to just experiment here with the red and see. See, when when you overlap your light like that, it really adds a sense of atmosphere to it because, you know, as we've talked already, the further things get back, the more they blend with the sky and this can really separate your foreground elements with your background elements. And we don't have to use this just with the sun, but this uh, blending mode can uh, work quite nicely with uh, maybe some of the lights inside the building. And sometimes I find that painting with our brush blending mode set to linear dodge can uh, have a more, uh, the more appropriate effect instead of just having the layers blending mode set to linear dodge. I usually try to paint on one layer and I, I don't ever really change the, that layer's blending mode. I just change the brush's blending mode. Usually when I, when I paint like that, linear dodge works really well. So let's try uh, painting those windows one more time. This time with the layer and the brush blending mode set to linear dodge. And what I like now, what it's doing is I can uh, start a window and then I can go over it a few more times and it has this like stacking effect of, of intensity. One of my favorite things to do with color and light to create kind of a dramatic effect is have a healthy amount of variations. So in the beginning, I not only started with an abstract canvas, but I start with abstract colors. Um, and this is to have that variation. A neat trick that I did through that process was I, I grabbed a bunch of different colors, one, but I also, once I had a healthy amount of colors on there, I went to filter, noise, add noise, and I changed, uh, I made sure that this monochromatic wasn't checked, and I just had, I think uniform is what I used, and then um, what that did was it added a bunch of little pixels, and I'll, I'll do a, the effect here again, and um, I'll change the uh, oh I'm on the wrong layer you know what we're just gonna blend these <laughs> layers together because I always this is why I paint on one layer I always am on the wrong layer maybe here 
is fine. And I'll do this uh, in the beginning of the process because each one of these little pixels now, look at look at the, the variation uh, shift uh, change just all over the place. I mean, not it's like so much variation going on there. So adding uh, the noise effect in the beginning of the process adds in a bunch of different variations of color. So when I do eye drop uh, a color, you see how it's shifting all around the place. So I can paint that, and then I can paint that, and then I can paint that, and that, and it, it's subtle, but it's it's just enough to add some uh, some interest in there. And if you take a look at the world all around you, or even a photograph, you'll notice uh, like the grass. It's not just you know yellowish green or just green it's got a, all kinds of different shifts and uh, slight hu slight hue shift and slight tone shifts which can add uh, another level of interest to your your paint so painting with linear dodge uh, brush on one layer we can add this if I choose the right color kind of neat effect and by stacking it uh, you can get some variations in there and then maybe I want to use an airbrush instead to make one of those windows pop even more I don't know but the, the idea is just to uh, start using uh, different blending modes in your paintings and you can find that they uh, can have some neat lighting effects especially that that color dodge one and linear dodge let's talk about thumbnails thumbnails are great little uh, practices that you can do before you get started on the final project it's a place where you design small so that you don't get too bogged down with details by drawing small you're focusing on just the light the mood if you don't already have a line drawing out for you you can work on composition this is a that challenge of the month that Jazza had these were my initial thumbnails the one on the top left was my original idea and I was like man I don't even want to do thumbnails and but I was like well you should because it's it's a great idea and the one on the top left was my favorite one I, once I got finished with it I was like oh yeah that's the one I'm gonna go with but then I was like well let's try you know something completely different let's think of something uh, different than what that scene is and then I did the second one I was like oh wow that's really good I did the third one as just kind of just something to change it up and once I finished it I was like no nah, that's that's probably not the one and but then I was looking at the second one a little bit more and then so what I did with that I just drug it down and I used the color balance tool to change uh, the colors a little bit and it kind of shifted it into this uh, kind of new aspect for me where I was like oh wow this could this one could really work and as I started comparing it with my original idea I was like well see with the original idea I gotta sell the uh, the idea that there's this light source behind the uh, the the uh, monument headstone or what, whatever the grave <laughs> site um, and so I that that would be a struggle like if, if it was not done correctly maybe you know people question it with this one this one there's not really anything to question um, as far as uh, you know the light is going so I was like alright well let's go with that one that one looks great and yeah so the, th the idea behind this is thumbnails great dish out your ideas even if you don't have like a, uh, a a big project that you're about to work on just work small in general as just little sketches to practice um, color and light um, just something to uh, experiment in you know it's not going to be some big project so you know try things start blending different colors together see what kind of color matches you got um, and if you like it and take it to a new document and, or whatever and uh, blow it up to a larger resolution start rendering that thing and soon you'll have this um, you know uh, this great piece you know we're gonna fail and projects so the idea also is to plan to fail like the, the blue sky one I I already knew that wasn't gonna work like I was like that's eh, stupid but I wanted to get it out there and it got a little bit of mileage into it so that's great don't just jump into these big projects because without you know experimenting a little bit okay I think that's all I gotta say about that now let's actually uh, do a live demo where I am working with thumbnails
Okay guys, welcome to the painting demo portion of this class. So as you can see, we got four different scenes here and we are going to uh, try to create a dramatically different color scheme for each scene. I felt like the easy way to do this was to just create four different seasons. Um, winter, summer, fall, and uh, yeah, I'm working on the winter one now. I don't know why I chose to do that one first. I think because I felt like it was going to be the most difficult one. But um, it actually turned out not too bad, I think. You notice that I started with a, a fully opaque color. I, I started with a fairly a dark, low saturated color to begin with. And that's because painting light is a lot easier when you're not working on an overexposed canvas. An over. Uh, <clears throat> An overexposed canvas being a white canvas um, so it's you can see just how like that red roof that I just applied um, it's a lot easier I, and, and it looks great I think when you when you can apply those brighter colors on top of that dark background on uh, some of these little squares um, well the fall scene I start with a more abstract canvas and I think uh, the, the word for this uh, class that I want you guys to uh, implement into your paintings or in future arts or even just consider is variety variety okay whether it's brush work color color temperature um, I think variety is everywhere in, in the real world so applying that in your artwork is essential. I have to give credit to one of my mentors. I've watched some of his YouTube videos and um, I've learned a lot from him and that is Marco Bucci. He's really taught me a lot um, as far as um, brushwork and lighting goes. One of the big things I think that I've learned from him is the abstraction that I can uh, start out with on a canvas and um, you know that that random brushwork I mean look at that mess right there in that fall scene I mean it's just all over the place I'm, I'm literally just playing around and having fun with it and that's that's what I really love about this style is uh, the enjoyment that uh, I get out of it it's just like being a little kid and splashing paint all around and uh but with that you like i i experiment with these different brushwork techniques and eventually once i get to a more you know technical part of the process and start refining things the the, the brushwork has a certain appeal to it and i love leaving some of that behind and um you know I, I don't really even paint um, to like a full rendered like here recently a lot of my paintings have been kind of like these little sketches and it, it just has this uh, certain um, impressionistic look that I, uh, I really enjoy but anyways let's uh, talk more about color um, I like doing these thumbnails because they allow me to strip out all the details and try not to get too bogged down. I don't try to zoom in and uh, render any of the bricks or anything in the house. I'm just focusing on the light and the the kind of form of the uh, the house there. And you know, if the light's hitting it from here, how's the cast shadow going to affect? What's the colors? Um, and for the fall scene, I am, uh, and I, most for a lot of these scenes, it, I use uh, warm light and cool shadows. Um, for the shadows in the fall scene, I'm, I'm going with a more purple um, than blue because that, maybe that's an artistic decision, but I think, I think in the fall, when you have orange everywhere, you, it, with the blue sky blending with those that orange, um, it's going to create more of a purple. And uh, it's also kind of trusting your eyes. Um, we're all in different stages um, as artists as far as, you know, what we can see and what looks good, you know, like our, our skill set and our what we can see or whatever. Anyways, 
I can personally see, um, like, I look at that purple, I think that, yeah, that looks ple pleasing. Much better than blue would, I think. Uh, well, actually, blue would look fine, too, because orange and blue are complementary colors. But anyways, warm warm light, cool shadow. It's good contrast, and that's the, the variety uh, aspect into it, you know, combining those warms and cools. Okay, so let's see where we're at. We're already at six minutes, and let me just take a look at my list. also mentioned choose an inter interesting light um, at the beginning I was joking about not doing uh, new like high noon lighting I mean you can do high noon lighting I think in, like in the woods or something that that would that looks actually pretty cool um, but try to go for interesting lighting at least that's what I go for and what interesting lighting for me is you know around that um, you know, a golden hour, I guess, sunset, something where the shadows get really dramatic, and I, I, I like playing with the cast shadows. I think uh, there can be a lot of drama with that. Um, so I'm trying to find interesting uh, lighting scenarios. So with this one, this night scene, um, I thought what could be interesting about a night scene um, I can challenge myself and try to make something look cool with just you know, no no additional lighting, just like m moon lighting. But why would I go through that trouble when I can make it even better and, you know, throw in like a nice little glow from the window to kind of illustrate uh, somebody's home and, you know, you can let the mind wander on what's going on in there. So that kind of goes with a good composition, I guess, or good storytelling. Um, yeah. And I'm about getting to the point on this piece where, um, oh, that there's a linear dodge for you, I think, um, for the for the glow effect on the window. So it doesn't always have to be this really intense sun to use linear dodge. You can do these soft glows. Um, the, uh, yeah. Notice how I'm not using really any black. Even my darkest colors there aren't pure black. And I think this is good advice for for anybody because, well, if I was talking to a younger self of me, what like if I was talking to me at a younger stage in my artistic growth, I would tell myself, stop using black because it's ruining your paintings. And stop adding so much contrast in the, in the end because it, it really, it makes it too dark and... You know, that when things get too dark or when you're using black, I feel like it's kind of a cover-up for the uh, lack of knowledge of, of those details. And when um, when you lack knowledge uh, as an artist, you, uh, you can either take an artistic approach to it or <laughs> you go find that information. Um, yeah, that's the first time I ever said that. I, maybe that might hold up true um, in the future. Or I'll just cut it out of this video once I realize, oh, that, does, that didn't really make sense at all. So, yeah, where are we at? I wanted to stop this at 10 minutes, and we're we're reaching about the 10-minute mark. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and um, let this play out until I start adding the rain effect on the, um, uh, the, the, the dark one. And I'm going to go into a video on it and that explains how I pull that effect off. Just a little bonus uh, for you guys. Um, is there anything I wanted to mention for this? Um, 
No, I think I covered just about everything I want to on my list here. So, yeah, uh, right there, actually, on the fall scene, I darkened my colors to add more room to go brighter. So if you kind of darken the whole image and then erase out where the bright spots are, it's a little bit better way to add contrast than just using, like, the curves or levels or brightness and contrast command. All right, so there I am adding the rain, and uh, let's... Uh, Let's go to that next video on how I did that. Okay, so here's the rain effect. First, you want to add a new layer, change that layer to black, and then go to Filter, Noise, Add Noise. And for the settings here, um, it doesn't really matter. Uh, you, you can pull off the effect w with both Uniform and Gaussian. Uh, you might see different results. Um, I I go with whatever selected, and if I don't like it, then I'll go back and experiment more. But uh, the main thing is uh, I have this set to monochromatic, um, so not with the color, but with just black and white. And then, um, so now we got our, uh, you know, dots and everything, and that's going to be what the rain's made out of. But next, we need to make it look a little bit more like rain, and that's going to go, and that's going to be filter, blur motion blur and here I'll uh, play with the distance um, I don't want to go t like that much I, that that to me doesn't really look like rain um, that just looks like a bunch of pinstripe lines so I um, you know that that looks a little bit more like rain and maybe I'll, I'll play with that a little bit more maybe something like that um, the angle I mean you can go with like an angle like that and it looks like you know the wind's blowing really hard but for what we need here I'm just gonna go with 90 so it's just going straight down and uh, we're gonna click OK now that we have the rain um, I'm gonna go ahead and change this to screen so we can see um, it without the black that gets rid of all the black um, and that looks okay not too bad but I'm gonna go ahead and bring up my levels to add some contrast for the uh, black and white so that the white will stand out a little bit more uh, making the rain stand out a little bit more um, and you don't have to use levels you can use curves or um, even up here an image adjustments brightness and contrast you can use uh, contrast I mean it works somewhat Maybe with Legacy turned on, it, it seems like it works a little bit better. Ooh, yeah. Yeah, that works actually pretty well. Use Legacy and then change the contrast to go up a little and then the brightness down. You can see how, you know, just it's just sprinkling here, which is it's pretty nice. And or if it's like pouring down the rain. Um, I, I actually like the sprinkles. And... That was pretty easy, so I don't feel like I need to go into levels, but just for the sake of it, you can you can adjust these too. Um, if, if you're familiar with levels and adding contrast that way. Some examples of this effect in uh, some more serious illustrations. Just recently in the challenge of the month for Draw Jazza, I did that uh, very effect right here. I'm using that noise and motion blur to add some rain here. Some of this is handmade, like uh, the, the actual splatters on his pants or um, down here in the, in the, the ground. Uh, but I, I didn't go overboard with it. So like over up here you, in the, the clouds, you can't, you can barely see any raindrops. They're more obvious over here by the light source, which is uh, the, uh, the ghost lady. And here's another example. Of, of that rain effect being used. Okay, I think that explains the rain. Uh, back to the, um, the, uh, the, the other video that we're working on. All right, let's finish this. We got about nine and a half minutes left on this. And um, yeah, there I am just struggling to uh, add a puddle effect. Um, I could probably benefit from studying a little bit more on puddles, but I know that there's some reflection in there from the building that, that'll probably be going in there, but that's not the focal point. So 
I quickly go on to the next thing. And that's kind of the, the approach that I'm going here. This is a, a technique that I've learned from Marco. Um, and it is uh, don't work on, like, don't just detail a uh, one spot and to it's like fully rendered and then work on the next spot. Like, I, I try to work on the, the whole canvas at, um, at the same time. You know, I want to bring all these four little um, houses uh, to a complete rendered stage for about the same time. Um, so, yeah. I think the, the bottom left one, the, uh, the rain one, um, came closer to a finish faster than the rest, but, you know, it's not a rule that I, you know, live by, but in general, I don't want to get bogged down with, uh, you know, overworking an area. Um, I want to, yeah, try to keep moving. And it's a, it's a nice pace. I, if you haven't tried working this way, I, I recommend it. It can be a change, and once you get used to it, it's, it's quite enjoyable, actually. You don't get bored as easily. I used to get bored doing art, and with this new working on the whole canvas at the same time technique, I, uh, uh, it's, it, it's just it's so fun again. And, yeah. I changed the lighting scheme on the winter one. I felt like I had this um, the same kind of lighting scenario in the top two, where it's the, sh the sun's coming and hitting the the building straight on. So I went for a more backlit approach, and it's been snowing here a lot lately. So I think somewhere I've locked down in my uh, memory that hey, uh, those sh shadows get really blue in snow, and everything's just brighter because the snow's so reflective. There was that linear dodge coming through for us, making everything look really interesting. I, I love that command. That's not something you can really do in traditional medium. So, but cr it creates this, that bloom effect that, I don't know. Don't, don't overuse it, though. You can definitely... Uh, destroy your painting or, or scream amateur uh, if you just lay that down everywhere. And it's kind of like lens flares. I, I used to use lens flares all the time in, in my paintings, but then, you know, if J.J. Abrams can learn to stop using lens flares, then so can we. Um, working on those uh, cast shadows for the trees. Um, as you notice, I added a little bit of atmosphere atmospheric perspective um on the trees and you know they're, they're starting to blend in with the background a little bit some of those ones in the in the back um you know i have this random scatter brush i also like to mention that it's not about the brush uh, it's about variety i think so find some brushes out there um you know it doesn't matter i mean a lot of the default brushes are fine A lot of artists say it's not about the brush, and I definitely agree with that. But I think it's it's nice if you find a good one that you really like. And there's a few of that that I do. I was struggling with that shadow there for a little bit on on the winter scene. I, I know the shadow needs to go there, but I was kind of trusting my eyes a little bit, and I was like, well, it doesn't really look right, and so. I kind of got rid of it, and now I'm working on something else. But I know that I'll have to go back to it and try to figure it out because I know that shadow is going to be cast in there. But I think the the light's just so bright behind it from the sun that maybe it's overlapping the the actual trees, and maybe um, it's kind of diffusing the shadow a little bit. Here's a technique where I actually use a the lasso tool, and I don't even think I implemented it, but as you saw, I used the lasso tool, and uh, I was trying to um, add some linear dodge, but I felt like it was probably too gimmicky, because um, I know I can overdo it. But using the lasso tool to lock in that shape can really help, you know, add some shape language um, and some interest there. Ah, <sighs> all right. Cast shadows, uh, if I could speak a little bit more about those, is something that I struggle with. Uh, on this house, in, um, actually, it was, was kind of hard figuring out what the cast shadow was going to be on on that roof. And you'll notice here in the end, <laughs> not always struggling with, struggling with it, 
Um, and that's something that I definitely need to work on. I wish I could have gotten more into uh, how to, you know, do cast shadows. But it's... The cool thing about color and light for me is uh, a lot of it you can fake. Like I said before, it's not about making it realistic. It's about making it believable. <laughs> And I, maybe there's a fine line there, who knows? I, maybe not. It, it seems like it's a little bit more forgiving, though. Like, I know these shadows here in this winter scene isn't 100% accurate, but I don't think anybody's questioning those shadows because, you know, it, that's kind of how the. No, nobody questions shadows in the real world, I guess. I don't know, but it, it, you, it seems like you can fake it just a little bit. Just the the idea alone uh, lets the viewer um, like they get it right hopefully that makes sense um oh yeah so I, I don't think I've mentioned color balance yet uh, color balance uh, is in your uh, effects panel or and you can go to like uh, I think it's filter I don't know. I hit Control B. Remember some hotkeys, guys. <laughs> I can't remember where it's at. I know if you click on that, like half moon, half uh, sun, or whatever, over in the uh, bottom right corner of your layers, um, you can you can get it from there too. Or if it's the FX, I can't remember. Just hit Control B. Color balance, guys. It can um, it can add some variety into. Um, well, it can change it to. It's fun to experiment with some of these pieces. Um, so hit Control B, and uh, you can use the sliders there to uh, change the overall temperature. And something that I like to do is I'll duplicate the layer that I'm painting on, use Control B to change the color balance, and maybe uh, erase out portions of that new layer so that part of the original uh, temperature that I had is coming through, and part of the new one is coming through. Um, it can add variety. Like I said, that was a word of, for the day. Um, all right, what are we doing here? Struggle with that cast shadow for the uh, tree. I was trying to add some of this dappled light, um, but I think I, I think I got it to a point where I was happy with. Yeah, I mean it's not too bad. Um, hmm. Just some refinement. Oh yeah, sharpen filter. Uh, control F, or actually I think it's not even Control F it, with the new CC products. Control F actually goes to Adobe Stock, I think. I hate that. Hate you Adobe for doing that. I use that for filters. I'm sure there's a way I can change it. But in your filters you can um, go to sharpen and kind of adds a extra sharpen to it, Chris. There I am struggling with the um, cast shadow on the roof. And that brings me to my last point I want to make about art. It's not, being an artist doesn't mean you have all the answers. Um, so, like I was struggling with this roof, obviously. <laughs> like that's, that's not how cast shadows work. And I didn't know that. I couldn't visually see it. And, you know, as an artist, you kind of think, oh, I should know these things um, because that's that's the identity I've set for myself. Um, and when you, but it's not it's not about knowing things. It's about, you know, having the passion to work hard and uh, keep striving to improve. And when you don't know something, figure figure it out. And if you don't know how to figure it out, figure out how to figure it out. <laughs> So with that shadow, I have some clay that I got for Christmas, and I was like, hey, I haven't touched that in like a few, <laughs> like the, all month. I played with it for a little bit when I first got it, and it's just been sitting here. I was like, whoa, nah, awesome, practical use now. So I made a little 3D model. It's crude for sure, but it's um, it's definitely uh, did, the, did the trick. Um, so I, I created the three little three D model uh, of the house, and then I uh, used my flashlight on my phone to uh, angle it, kind of similar to the uh, the lighting situation that I was going for. And I could see based on my model and the shapes on how that shadow is actually behaving. And I think I got to a point where I was happy with um, with the shadow. So if you don't know the answer, 
strive for fi figuring it out. You know, whether it's making something out of clay, learning a new 3D program, or asking, you know, one of your mentors. I want to say thank you for watching the class, and I hope that you guys were entertained, and uh, more importantly, I hope that you guys learned something on color and light. And really, more importantly, I hope that uh, you, you're able to take something from this class and apply it to your art and improve your artistic skills. Now, this is usually the point where I will sign a project, but after doing a few classes and having over 1,200 students, I've realized Nobody really does the projects. I've had maybe three or four students to do the projects that I signed, so I'm not gonna sign a project. Uh, you guys can upload anything that you want down in the project gallery. Whatever current art project you're working on or any good resource material you wanna share with the class, uh, that would be fine with me. As something that you can do ongoing is continue your education. This is definitely not the uh, everything you need to know about color and light class. This is just one guy and his experience with color and light and how it's affected his art. So uh, something that I always like to do is uh, do little thumbnail studies of artists that I really uh, admire. And other than that, uh, study from real life, do some plein air paintings, do some still lives, read some books. Uh, Color and Light by James Gurney is definitely a fantastic one. Marco Bucci over at YouTube has some great videos on Color and Light. So continue your education on art, something that you never become a master at. You're always trying to work and improve. At least that's how I feel about me my artistic growth. Uh, this is the end. This is where I say goodbye. But if you guys do want to keep up with me, you can follow me over at Instagram. That's Instagram.com slash Kitten Bombs or just search Kitten Bombs. I'm always uh, posting over there of new art projects, work in progress, some art videos, and I'll even do a giveaway every now and then. Well, that's, uh, that's about it. I don't really have much else to say, so cue the outro cello.